All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This week, I want to start with one of the um, most powerful verses for me personally to read this week. I just came back from a, a trip to the land of Israel that was too short, but I had the opportunity to spend it with, um, with some of the most courageous people I've ever met, the the young men and women who are serving in the Israeli Defense Forces, and especially the men who are on the uh, front lines and uh, had an opportunity to see them, spend a lot of time with them, just be so impressed by their incredible bravery and courage and commitment to Am Yisrael. So what I want to focus on today is a verse from our, actually a couple of verses from our, from our Torah portion that relate to the land of Israel. And just to go over some basic laws that are derived from these verses so we can just learn about the mitzvah of gratitude and humility in the face of people who are serving the Jewish people in this um, in this time of eight sarah, as we say, this difficult time for us. So, in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse seven, hey, hey, it's all. So, it's all was with me in the land of Israel, and I was just talking to Saul about since I was exposed to the the great courage of the Chayalim and the Chayalot. Uh, this past, actually this week, I saw up close the people who went straight from the front lines to celebrating the wedding of of a boy serving in the army, and they give them and a girl serving in the army, and they gave them ten days off, and then they go straight back to the front lines. So we dive in very much for their safety and their strength and their commitment to to Am Israel to be protected. In the, uh, this Lutam to protect not only them but all of us. So, uh, therefore, I want to focus for a few minutes at the beginning on some of the psukim from our parsha that talk about the land of Israel. Just go over some of the halacha. Afterwards, if we have time, and I hope we will, I want to talk about where tomorrow's daf Yomi mentions this week's parsha. See if uh, if Bitzal can get that tomorrow's daf Yomi. At uh, Baba Basra 58, where it mentions this week's parish without looking, without looking. Can't look. No, no looking. Okay. So, says the, says the Pasuk, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7. Hashem, your God, will bring you to a good land. Eretz Nachoimayim, a land filled with streams of water. Ayano Tutomot, springs and depths. Yotzimba Bikovahar, and goes out in the valley and also in the mountain. There's not too much Midrash Halcha on that. So basically, we want to go to the next Pasuk, which is the famous one, the classic one. Eretz Chita Usaora. Kefen Uteina Verimod, land of wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, arets, zait, shemen, udvach, a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8. So just before we go to the Midrash, Allah Khan this. I want to just quote the Rashi. What does it mean when it says this land of milk and honey? Eretz Kito Sora, Eretz Zait Shemen Udvash. What does it mean, Zait Shemen? Uh, she says, Zaitima Usim Shemen, olives which produce oil. I mean to say, Zait Shemen, olive of oil. So Rashi is saying that basically. The olive of oil is not the same thing as the oil of an olive. 
So, so the oil of olive means oil which is produced from the olive, but the olive of oil means olive which produces oil. Okay, it's a subtle point. Now we come to the Gemara and Brachos Mem Aleph from an Aleph. I guess I can tell you a joke about this. Probably it's really a little too esoteric, but since my grandfather used to tell it to me, uh, I'll, I'll tell it to you. It, 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 my grandfather, he 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 threw out the Talmud like he spoke in the language of the Talmud. So he told me this joke when I was seven or eight, and I didn't understand it until I was maybe twenty-five. But it's because it was it, it encompassed the Talmud. So the Gemara and Brachos Mem Aleph Amad Aleph says about this verse: a land of wheat and barley. Then the Gemara and Brachos, the Amar Rav Yosef Itema Rabbi Yitzchak, Ko Muktam BePasuk Ze Muktam Bracha. Anything which it comes prior in this verse comes prior to recite the blessing. So, Shenemar Eretz Chita Usaora, the Gevin Teina of Rimon, Eretz Zait Shemen Udavash. So, because it says the land of wheat and barley, grapes and vines and pomegranates, the land of Zait Shemen, the olive of oil, and Devash and honey. And the honey means the date honey. So, whichever word is closer, whichever uh, fruit is closer to the word Eretz, that's what comes first to recite the bracha. You make the bracha on that first. Before we go into the Midrash Halacha about it, um, I wanted to say the joke that my grandfather said. It's, you know the joke that's all on this? So, okay, so this is the joke. Um, basically, it's a it's a really esoteric joke from the Talmud that there was a boy who was going to get a entrance exam into the yeshiva. He wanted to see if he was holding in the Talmud to be a good enough student to be allowed in. And the way they wanted to test him was through this pasuk. But it's not so simple. The pasuk, okay, it seems pretty straightforward. But what if? There's a food that's closer to you and another food that's closer. So there's contradictory rulings and contradictory values, conflicting, competing values. So you don't always know which uh, which fruit to make the, the blessing on first. So, so the boy, when it, the entrance exam was, they laid out these fruits and he had to make the, he had to say which one I should make the bracha on. So, So the um, so the boy didn't know what to do. So he said, okay, I have to go to the bathroom. So he asked the, he asked the Bochein, can I go to the bathroom? So, so they, uh, um, so he went to the bathroom. He comes back. I think I'm going to mess up the punchline. He comes back from the bathroom and the Rebbe says to him, uh, the Rebbe sees that this guy is going to the bathroom and, and he knows what he's going to do. That in the bathroom, this guy's going to look up the answer. They didn't like that. So when the guy goes to the bathroom, the, the Rebbe switched around the food on the table. So it was different order. So the guy comes back and he sees that the Rebbe was no dummy and he moved the fruits around. So he wasn't going to find the, uh, he wasn't going to get the answer. So he said, okay, I have to go to the bathroom again. Goes to the bathroom again. He looks it up on Google or whatever. And he comes back in and the Rebbe moved it around again. The Rebbe's no fool. And after he did this, he says, the guy comes back. He says, I need to go to the bathroom again. So what does the Rebbe say to him? Betzal, do you remember? And the Rebbe says to him, quotes the Gemara. I forget the daft, but I'll tell us. He says, pish, pish, v'lo matzah. That, and if he says, you, pish, pish in the Gemara, is a uh, here it, obviously in Yiddish it means something else in English it means something else but the Gemara means search search and you don't find that if you want to know why these Yisurin are coming upon yourself you search search and you don't find then you have to look in your in your studies that I ain't believe you have to continue to study so the Rebbe said to him pish pish for a matzah it's like a joke only if you know the Gemara perfectly like my grandfather 
and you understand the English, you know, then you'd say this guy, you're going to the bathroom twice and you still didn't find it. There's a double entendre between a Talmud and English slang. He says, it means you need to study more. I mean, you're not ready to enter into the exam. Anyway, that's a, that's a joke that my grandfather told me. And that has always stuck with me about this Pasuk. So that's one of the strongest memories I have of my grandfather. He lived to always in... Um, he lived till I was 14 or 15, but that was like 35 years ago. So that's it's amazing what sticks with you. Sometimes a joke that a Rebbe tells you or a grandfather tells you, but that joke to me symbolizes who he was as a person who had a sense of humor, but he also, his whole life was a Talmud. He thought in the Talmud, and I guess he was expecting me uh, to be able to, of course, hop that joke, even though I was seven or eight when he was telling to me. So, uh, so we're going along with what uh, the, uh, Rev. Stern says that in Egypt. So, what was the big deal about having this land filled with zeit shemen and vash? So, Mayor Simcha, Mayor Simcha um, explains that in Egypt there was no oil and honey. How do we know this? How do we know that in Egypt there was no oil and honey? Because when Yaakov Avinu sent to Yosef, uh, he sent he sent him Mizimrosa Aretz. He sent him from the from the prunings of the land of Israel. What did he sell him? What did he send him? Maat Dvash. So Genesis chapter 43, verse 7, he sent a little bit of honey. And also in the Mitlonanim, when they say, why did you bring us up from Egypt to bring us to this bad place? This bad place. It's not a place of Zara to Eno Gefin and Rimon. It's not a place where they are planting figs, grapes, and pomegranates. But they don't mention oil and honey. So because in Egypt they didn't have it. And so therefore, the land of Israel is praised with Zait Shemin Udvash. And so therefore, it's telling us that Zait Shemin Udvash was something unique to the land of Israel, which was not available in the land of Egypt. Now, the there is a halacha also. What do we learn from this pasuk of Eretz Chita Mesora? So the Gemara Brachos, I read to you the Gemara Brachos Mem Aleph Amud Aleph tells us, Amar Rabbi Chanan, Ko Apasuk Kuo L'Shiur Nemar. This whole verse of Eretz Zeit Shemun Udvash, Eretz Chita Mesora, Gefen Tainer Imona, Eretz Zeit Shemun Udvash. The whole verse is meant to teach us Shiurim, mean to say the measurements of how we know. How me, how things are measured in the in the Torah, um, and so the meaning to say through our Jewish life we learn out every single thing about how we measure things. Meaning to say, if you break it down, and I'll say how each thing each of the measurements teaches us, it teaches us that the way we measure our lives comes from this one verse, which is the most powerful verse in the entire Torah about the land of Israel. I mean, to say the land of Israel stands at the center of how we measure our life. Even if we're not in Israel, our whole life is measured by the land of Israel. And now I'll read to you uh, the Gemara's explanation. Chita, now it's going to be a little bit esoteric. It's a little, you know, it's inside Talmud, as we say, but we'll do the best we can to try and explain it. Chita, wheat, ditnan, hanichnas labayit ha That if somebody enters into a house of, uh, um, if somebody enters into a house of that is uh, a house of that has leprosy on it, and hayalavush kelav v'sandalav b'ralav, if he's wearing his clothing and his shoes are on his feet, v'tabosav v'etzbosav, and his ring is on his finger, who tummy miyad? He is tummy immediately. So when he walks into a house, if that house has leprosy, bear in mind, bear in mind. That according to at least one opinion in the Gemara, there never was and never will be such a house that will have leprosy, but that's irrelevant. If you walk into a house that has leprosy, you become ritually pure immediately. But what about your clothing? At what, to- what point do they become ritually impure? Because your clothing can, can become ritually impure separate from you. So that is, in the clothing are ritually pure until it takes the time for you to eat a loaf of bread, a loaf of wheat bread and not barley bread, the Gemara continues. So we see from here that wheat is needed to know the measure of how quickly uh, your clothing becomes tamay, richly impure, when you enter into a house that is 
a house of leprosy. What about barley? So we say, Let's say you have a bone that is the size of a barley corn. So if you have a bone the size of a barley corn and you touch this bone, then you then you become tame by touching it. So at what point do you become richly impure? By touching a bone. So that is by touching a bone the size of a barley corn. And so therefore we need barley. That teaches us about barley. What about gaff? And what about wine? What's the measurement of wine? Kadei revius yayin nazir. So this is a quarter lug of wine. If a nazir drinks this, he's in violation of the biblical violation of, of the biblical prohibition against a nazir drinking wine. Also, we know that for the Seder, for example, you have to drink a cup that holds a revius of wine, but that's not a biblical obligation. So the biblical obligation, a biblical prohibition of a Nazarite drinking wine comes from this verse. What's teina? What's a fig? Kigro, kigro geres. A fig uh, is, this is something we had recently in the Daf Yomi, well, it's all Shabbos. That if on carrying on Shabbos, if you take out something that is, you're violating Shabbos only when you take out something that is the size of a dried fig. If you take out something that's less than the size of the dried fig and carry it on Shabbos, you're not in biblical violation. And we discussed uh, two days ago in the Dafyomi, what if you take out a half a dried fig and then you remember it's Shabbos and then you take out another half a dried fig. So then you're not in violation because it's considered to be two separate acts. So you're not in the biblical violation of Shabbos. And What's a pomegranate? Meaning to say as follows. I'll translate it and then I'll explain what it means. All the utensils of Bali Batin, meaning unlike professional workers, regular, regular people who have utensils, the measurement is a pomegranate. What does the Gemara mean by this? That means to say, let's say you have a utensil. That's a pottery utensil. And the pottery utensil became, becomes that becomes tame. When does the utensil become tahor? Again, only when it's not usable. Only when it's not usable. So what is the size in which a utensil is no longer usable? When the utensil has a hole the size of a pomegranate. If it's smaller than the size of a pomegranate, then people will find a use for that utensil. Okay, the next is Eretz Zayt Shemen, olive oil. Amr of Yosef Bar So what did we learn from olives? So this is Eretz Shekol Shiurea Kizaitim, a land where all of its measurements are um, a land where all of its measurements are um, the size of olives, and so, and so, therefore, if uh, basically the baseline measurement is the size of an olive, kizayit, like the size of an olive. So the Gemara says, "Well, kol shi all of its measurements." But what about the ones we just said? Ella eretz sharov shi kizayim, a land where most of the measurements are like olives. Meaning to say, this refers to the prohibition of eating non-kosher meat. Prohibition of eating blood. Most of the measurements are olives. That's the baseline measurement. If you're not sure what's the what's the prohibition, it's an olive. And what about honey? Again, we said honey refers to dates. So therefore, what is devash? This is the prohibition, the biblical prohibition. Actually, on uh, on Yom Kippur, you're not allowed to eat any amount. But the kares prohibition, where you get kares, that's if you eat. Uh, a, a size of a date. And so sometimes where you um, have to eat for whatever reason on Yom Kippur, so then, people, then uh, sometimes the ruling or the guidance, the spiritual guidance from your rabbi will be to eat less than a size of a date so that you, even though you're, you're violating the biblical prohibition, you're not violating the most severe aspect of it. Um, so... There's a story about whether or not these measurements still apply 
in the exact same way they appeared before. And you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not they apply exactly like it. So, so some want to say that the measurements that our olives today are significantly smaller and our measurements are significantly smaller. And so therefore we have to make them bigger. And the story about this that's attributed to the Noda Yehuda, where the whole thing relates to about one of his, whether, you know, he smiled when they brought up to him that it's, they are actually the same size. But that's for a different discussion. So that's one aspect of this verse. So, so far we've seen two aspects of this verse. The first was that it's to teach us the order in which you recite a blessing on fruits and vegetables when they're in front of you. And the second is to teach us the uh, idea of measurements of, of, all, of all the things that we measure in our tradition. A third aspect, okay, I'll pause for a moment, but I was going to say the third aspect of the halachot that we learn in respect to this. And then uh, I don't want to say a fourth, but for now I'll just say this. So a third a third time where this pasuk was cited in the Talmud relates to Gemara and Brachos 44a, and I'll read the read the pasuk. The pasuk says, actually it's a Mishnah. The Mishnah says, and 44a says the Mishnah, so again, if you eat weed or barley, you have to make the motzi, and afterwards you 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 make the berkat uh, hamazon. That's the next verse. Or tupsukim v'chaltem b'savato veirachta. You have to say the berkat hamazon. But let's say you ate grapes, figs, and pomegranates. Then, you have to say after them, not the Birkat Amazon, but what's called Shalosh Brachot. Shalosh Brachot, which is what is uh, we sometimes call Al Mechia, like colloquially, but it's the blessing that's not as long, a post eating blessing that's not long, as long as Birkat Amazon, but it is significant. The Chachamim say, uh, that you don't, so the first approach of Rabbi Gamliel was you say the Shalosh Brachot. So that's a reference to like Berkat Hamazon, where the Chacham say Bracha Achot Mein Shalosh. Whereas the Chacham's position is you say this thing that we call the, uh, um, uh, what we call colloquially Ala Perot, but instead, Ala Mechia, but instead we are saying it on grain, like a cookie, we say it on fruit. My time at Rabbi Gamliel, what's the reasoning of Rabbi Gamliel that you actually say this? Birkat Hamazon, which is the, the three blessings. So Rabbi Gamil's position is based upon the fact that it says here, Eretz Kito Sora, the land of wheat and barley. And then it says, Asher Wobam Miskinu Tochal Balachem. And then it says, Vechal Tavis Avato Beirach, that's Hashem Um And, and meaning it says, you shall make the Birkat Hamazon. So Rabbi Gamil's position was that you actually have to make the Birkat Hamazon even on grapes, figs, and pomegranates. Now we don't rule like that. We rule uh, that the Rabban, like the Rabbanon, would say that Eretz Hifsika Inyan, and when it says Eretz Asher Wobe Miskinu Tochal Balechem, it interrupts the verse of Yachal Tavis Avato Veirachem. So it's a fundamental dispute between the Rabbanon and Rabbi Gamliel whether you eat one of these seven species fruits, whether you say the Birkat Hamazon. But, but the lenient position is the position of the Rabbanon, which is how we rule that if you eat one of these fruits of the seven species of the land of Israel. You make a, a bracha achas mein shalosh that you make what's called alagefen uh, or uh, alaperos of the land of Israel. So there is a machokas rishonim whether or not this blessing, which we call colloquially our nachiyah, but we're really referring to when it's said in response to the seven fruits of the land of Israel, whether it's rabbinic or not. Uh, uh, because the verse achal tavis avatu the idea that you have to say birkat amazon. That is actually uh, a biblical obligation. And so therefore, this verse in between interrupts it. And so therefore, it's only rabbinic. That's what, how the uh, Rambam rules. Uh, um, excuse me. So that's how, that's how some rule. But the Rambam says that it's a biblical obligation, meaning to say that, that the word, when, the, when the Gemara says that the Eretz interrupts it, it's telling us that it's not the same amount of blessings that you have to say after eating wheat or barley, but you still have a biblical obligation. Uh, so therefore we see that this idea that you have to make a blessing after a bracha achrona, after eating grapes and, and pomegranates and figs is a biblical obligation. Um, 
What about the blessing beforehand, before eating these fruits? Is that a biblical obligation? So generally speaking, we have a principle that there is not a biblical obligation to recite a blessing. The only biblical obligation to recite a blessing is after eating uh, the, the birkat hamazon. And also, generally speaking, about the, before studying Torah for the first time. But what about this blessing? before eating one of the seven species. So the Jerusalem Talmud says that the blessing beforehand is, in this case, with respect to these seven species, is, is also going to be a biblical obligation. That's what the Yerushalmi says. And that, that, so there are actually the idea that there is an obligation to recite a blessing, biblically speaking. And the Gemara tells us that Rabbi Akiva said that you learn because it's like a thief. But that's not that that would make it a rabbinic obligation. It's just like you can't take something before asking. So too the obligation to recite a blessing is is along those same lines that we'd be stealing from God if we didn't recite a blessing. The when was this blessing instituted? So the Rashba writes that the blessing beforehand is in general is rabbinic and these verses that we're supposed to that uh, that we're supposed to recite a blessing beforehand is there's no actual proof that it's that it's actually biblical and even and even though the blessings were instituted uh during the time of when were all when were the blessings instituted during the time of what's called the Anshe Knesset Hagdola so so therefore the exact form of the blessings were instituted at that point, but nevertheless, even earlier, um, even earlier, we know that there were blessings. How do we know that there was a blessing? Where were there was a, where was there a blessing set in the Torah? Anybody know where there was a blessing set in the Torah? Which which blessing was set in the Torah? I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. It's in the book of Genesis, and it's brought down as a blessing. In the Tosos to Ksuvos Dainama Bays. <laughs> so, so the blessing is called the Birchas Khatanam, the blessing over the groom. It's not even it's even a question. We don't even know what that blessing was exactly. There is a blessing that was said under it's not most likely not referring to the blessing that was said today under the Chuppah. But it says about Rebecca that when she left, it says Vayivarhuat Rifka that they blessed her. So we see from here that even though these blessings in general, the concept of blessings is not biblical. Nevertheless, they used to have this idea, even in the time of the Torah, they were reciting blessings, even though we say it's rabbinic. Okay, so now I want to just say the last point where we say the seven species are relevant. Where else are they relevant? Anybody know one more halacha in which they apply? So I'll tell it to you. Where else do we need to know these seven species? Very, very important. I'll tell you a question I once had. Uh, which I asked to a um, uh, big posig today, and he gave me an answer. But this is the um, idea of the first fruit, the bikurim. The bikurim. So it says the Mishnah says the Mishnah that ein mevian bikurim kutz mi shivat aminim. The only that there is an idea that when there's a first fruit that appears in your field, you're supposed to tie a, a, like a rubber band around it and say, these fruits are the Bikurim. But these, this mitzvah of the first of the Bikurim only comes from the seven species. That's where the mitzvah of the Bikurim is. And also only comes from the land of Israel. It doesn't apply to the fruits outside the land of Israel. So the, as the Gemara in, uh, as the Yerushalmi in uh, Bikurim tells us, it says, Ein Mavim Bikurim, it says, we only bring the Bikurim from the seven species. Now, if it had written, V'lakachta reshit kol priyadama, if it had said, you shall take the first of all the fruits of the land, I would say, Bikurim. So I would think that all the fruits in the land uh, um would be applicable. So therefore the verse says, Mi reshit will call reshit. And if we just say, Mi reshit will call reshit, I would say, you only have to bring it from the wheat and barley itself. So the verse says, Priyad matcha. 
So that includes what's it including? So therefore, it says Eretz and it says Eretz Chito Sarevash. So it compares it to our land. It says you have to bring the fruits from your land, and here it says the land of wheat and barley. So therefore, the Gemara says we do what's called a uh, a Gzeira Shaba, and we compare the words and say that therefore the Bikurim only comes from the seven seventh fruits. So then the Gemara says, I might think it's actually honey. Uh, how do I know it's date honey? So he says, it says, he cites a verse that says that when the matter spread, the children of Israel increased. Uh, and devash is something that we have to bring a tithe on. So what does this refer to? These refers to the dates that are obligated to be tithed. So, okay, so this is the idea of that the Bikurim has to come only from these seven fruits, it's derived from this verse. So the mitzvah of bringing the first fruits up to the land of Israel. And there, when we get to the land of Israel, you recite this, uh, you recite the passage that we have at the beginning of Parshas Kitavo, the passage of gratitude that I was, I, I was uh, uh, an Aramean, either I was a wandering Aramean or an Aramean trying to destroy my father. And then you brought us down to Egypt and you saved us. All oh, this is the passage that we call the Bikurim passage, or bring our first fruits to the land. All this is the reading of the Bikurim, and all this only comes from the seven fruits. So I'll tell you the question I once asked to a posik. I don't want to say his name because, uh, okay, why not? I can say his name. What's the difference? He gave me the answer. I once asked Rabbi Lopiansky, I saw I was sitting there in my uh, in my yard, and we have a persimmon tree in our yard. And I said, can I, um, can I, and, and my kids were very little at the time. I said, am I allowed to uh, take like a rubber band and tie it around the persimmon tree and sh tell my kids that this is, if this was in the land of Israel, we would have to, and if this was one of the seven species, we'd have to bring a Bikurim from it to teach him about the Bikurim. And so he said, I can do it. He said, I'm allowed to do it. But then he quoted for me a Gemara, which says that you're not allowed to call, like, uh, if you don't have an esrog, you're not allowed to take a pair and say, this is an esrog. So basically, you have to be very careful and very clear that when you try to do something and it's not the exact thing, you have to be very clear that this is not the mitzvah. So you have to be very clear that this is not the mitzvah of Bikurim. But if you want to teach people the uh, uh, mitzvah of Bikurim and use this as a prop, that would be okay. Once I started going down that road, I got confused and I'm like, you know what? I could, I just didn't feel right. So I said, I'm not going to do it. But that was, um, uh, okay. So before we go up to the next bracha, I wanted to share with you how the parasha, so we always have to mention something about the name of the parasha. Before we go on to the next pasha, which I want to talk about, if we have the time, I said, let me just tell you how the how parasha's Akev appears in the Dafyomi for tomorrow. Since nobody said how it appears, I'll tell you how it appears. It's a beautiful story, a very, very beautiful story. So the story is as follows. It's a very, uh, actually, unusual story. Um, and I'll tell it to you. If you want to explain to me what it means, I'll be grateful. <laughs> That's the type of story it is. So Rabbi Bina, so there's Rabbi Bina. He appears, he appears several times in the Shas. I think the name Bina is related to Bina, understanding. He was a rabbi who was very wise. And we're not going to get to it today, but you see that he has the wisdom of Solomon. So have a Kometzayim Arta. So this rabbi, he would go around and mark in graves. Why did he mark the graves? A few theories. One theory is he wanted to say, uh, uh, don't go here so that you can understand who is the uh, who is a Torah scholar. Uh, excuse me. You, so you can understand here's where there's a dead body. So don't go here. There's a dead body here. Or uh, perhaps he was marking the grave so you can know um where to where to visit the tzaddik so you can know how to pray properly. But then he came to the cave of Abraham. He came to the Ma'ara Tamach Pewa, the tomb of the patriarchs. He found Eliezer, the servant of Abraham. And then when he found Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, uh, he was standing at the gate. Why well, was Eliezer there? So Rashbam tells us that Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, 
he was he was still alive. He never actually died. Uh, the Rashbam quotes Mesechas Derach Eretz that there are seven righteous people that never died, and one of the righteous people who never died was the servant of Abraham. Go figure. We just thought he was just the guy who Abraham refused to allow his son to marry his daughters. And Rashi there says, because you are cursed and your daughter is cursed. But here we see that he was a tzaddik who never died. So he said to him, what's Abraham doing? So he said, Eliezer says, Eli, I'll tell you what, what, what he's doing. He's sleeping in the arms of our mother, Sarah, and she's looking at his head. She's just looking at his head. What a beautiful image. Meaning to say that their love transcended transcended life. Their love was was even found in death. And she was holding him and staring at his head. So Rabbi Benoah said to Eliezer, go tell him that Benoah is standing at the gate. Tell him I want to go in. So Abraham responds, go up. And you should be aware that there's not a problem coming into my bedroom, basically into my house while I'm in the bedroom with my wife because there's no inclination in this in this next world. I Meaning say there's no physicality in the next world. So you could come in, you don't even have to knock. So he went in and he marked the grave. Okay, so he marked the grave. So when he came to then, then he was he's in the tomb of the patriarchs. So he's marking all the graves. When he came to the to the grave of Adam, a heavenly voice came out and said, uh, even though you've already seen what I look like, meaning to say you saw Jacob and Jacob was a reflection of Adam. He said, you can't look at my image directly. You couldn't look at my image, which is the image of Adam, because Adam was created by God directly. And so therefore, don't look at it. So he says, but I need to. I need to mark the grave. So he says, still, you can't do it. So... So he wasn't allowed in. So he says, but still, what, how am I going to mark the grave? So they said, don't worry, you mark it up on top, and exact measurements that are on top, they'll be below. So, so says Rabbi Bina, I looked at his two, I looked at his two heels. Our parish is Akev. We don't know how to translate Akev, really. Rashi says Akev means the heel, like Yaakov. It's uh, interesting that when he tried to look at the, that we compare the image of Yaakov to like the image of Adam. That's a very interesting connection, What? why Jacob is like Adam. And here he's saying he wasn't allowed to look at Adam, but he was able to look at Adam's heels. So, so, what did he see when he looked at Adam's heels? That the two heels of Adam were similar to the Galgale Chama, the circle of the sun. So it's a very, there's a lot to unpack with this, with this teaching. The two heels of Adam are like the circles of the sun. First of all, why? how was he able to get in there to see the heels if he wasn't able if he wasn't able to enter into the grave? How was he able to see the heels? So Rav Yaakov Emden asks that question, and he says, he says, you know, that maybe it's in the in his vision. It's not basically it's not to say that this was all just a dream. We don't have to take this story literally. Okay, but that begs the question. What's the idea here? The idea here really is that, well, before I say what the idea is, let me just back a step. Let's see what the Rashbam says. The Rashbam says, wait, what were the heels doing there? Doesn't the verse say, you are dust, from dust to dust? Yeah, God cursed Adam, you're going to go back to earth. That's the whole idea, from dust to dust. It was said about Adam. So how is his, uh, how is his heel, how are his heels still in existence? So the Rashbam says, no, that means one moment before resurrection, he was going to turn into, he was going to turn into dust, and then I'll be resurrected. So Adam's body still has not decomposed. It's a trick question you could ask people. Okay, fine. Now the question is, what's the significance? Okay, I want everybody to this. I'm going to open it up. See if anybody has an answer. What's the significance 
I'm saying that Rabbi Bena looked at the heels of Adam and he saw the sun. And well, how does that connect to our portion? How does that connect to our portion? So I'm going to pause. Okay. So it reminds me personally of the image of Moshe Rabinu trying to see God's face in Parashas Kisisa. He's not able to see God. He's only able to see his back. So here we have the similar idea that Rabbi Bena was trying to see Adam. He couldn't see Adam. He could only see the heels. Can't see directly. And But he even here, he couldn't really see them. They're like the circle of the sun. You can't see the sun. The sun is too bright. So he couldn't even look at Adam's heels because he's not like Rabbi Bena. He's not on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, but how does it relate to our Parsha? So our Parsha at the very beginning says, Ekev if in the heels you will listen to. That's how Rashi says that if you listen to the mitzvot kawa, to the light commandments that a person presses on with his heels and he doesn't take seriously enough, then, then right, it, it could have really said im tishmoon, but it doesn't say if you listen. It says ekev tishmoon. So it means to say, if you will listen with even those commandments that are pressed upon the heel, then God will protect you. But from our Gemara, we're gaining tremendous insight into this Rashi. Our Gemara is telling us, Ekev Tishma'un means to say, all we're go ever going to get, this is, the, this is the teaching, this is the teaching. All we're ever going to understand about God, all we could even possibly dream of understanding is the Akev. And even that we can't understand. The Akev, all Rebbe Bina was able to look at, he wasn't even able to look at Adam's face. Because Adam was too close to God. He was created directly by God. So he couldn't even look at God. He was only able to look at his heels. And even the heels he couldn't look at because the heels were the sun. So when we, when we want to have Akev Tishmu, we're never going to come anywhere close to understanding God. We'll never, ever, ever. But if nevertheless, even though we won't have a proper understanding of God, we still listen to his commandments, we guard everything he says, then, then Hashem is going to give us these blessings. Then Baruch Amin. Then God will bless you from amongst all the Asians. So that's what this Gemara is telling us, that our relationship with, with God is a relationship of Akev, that we can only come to understand the heels. And in that context, if we still listen, then we will receive the blessings from Hashem. Anyway, these are some of the teachings I have for today. I'm happy to answer any questions.